New York, 1978. Dr. Joseph Son Abbott was working at his sexual health clinic in Greenwich Village in New York City, and he began to notice strange symptoms in his patients. Low white blood cell counts, rare forms of pneumonia, cancers, and organ enlargement. And soon, his patients developed symptoms that they couldn't recover from. That was the start of a journey that would put Joseph at the forefront of the AIDS epidemic. He worked ceaselessly amid the trauma to find out the scope of this terrifying condition in the 1980s and 1990s. And his compassion for his patients was, in part, inspired by music, his own piano playing, and his composition. Now, Joseph was born in what was then Rhodesia, and is now Zimbabwe, in 1933. Now 87 and living in London, he had his first major concert as a composer a couple of years ago, including this piece, Mirage. I spoke to Joseph Sonabend leading up to World AIDS Day on the 1st of December. Where was this love of music first sparked? I was taught the piano from an age I can't remember. It was that early in my life, so... I do remember when I was a schoolboy, I resented having to practice, you know, around the age. I wanted to go out and play with my mates, so I think that's a common experience. My mother was a physician, she was a busy doctor, but she liked music, and in those days, uh, the records you could get were old uh, 78 records. So that's what I was brought up with, and she had quite a collection. So I was at school in the 1930s, I was born in 1933, the war started in 1939, I grew up in southern, southern Rhodesia, a place called Bulawayo. It was the second largest city in the colony. And it was isolated. There was nothing around it except bush. But within the confines, it was a kind of hive of cultural activity, largely because of the refugees, mostly Jewish refugees from Czechoslovakia, Germany, Hungary, all those places. And they brought orchestras and wonderful cooking with them and this cultural treasure that came with the refugees. So. It was part of life. It wasn't an escape from anything very much. Were you composing? Uh, uh, no, not really. I used to improvise when I was a kid. I remember that. You see, I'm fascinated listening to your music. There's performances from a couple of years ago, a very special concert in 2018. Um, Michael Finnessy's playing a piano piece of yours called Mirage. And right. you could say there are maybe influences of turn-of-the-century harmony, maybe right. Schoenberg, maybe Lake Brock. I want to hear where it comes from in you, but it also doesn't sound quite like anyone else. So it's uh, where, where that comes from. I said my mother had a collection of records and one of the recordings that I turned to a lot around about the age of 12 was a, a collection of the orchestral interludes from Wojciech. From Abba Berg's opera uh, Wojciech? Yeah, yeah. They were favourites. I don't know what to say. We're a 12-year-old 12, 12 boy whose mates were playing rugby and sort of climbing the walls, and which was, I did too, you know. But in that environment, in that tropical environment, I just absolutely turned on to that particular kind of music. So I think I developed a kind of taste for that sort of chromatic, somewhat discordant, kind of over-the-top kind of expressionist to <laughs> me. <laughs> In a sense, this has been a private part of your life or a yes, part of your yes. life which has been yours and not shared until recently with the rest of the world. But when, when did you start to compose in earnest in your own Postbergian idiom? I think round about in the 1990s with the advent of notation software because before that I used to write things down on pieces of paper which would get lost and that motivated me to take it more seriously about preserving stuff, you know. I was a very busy doctor. Indeed, and you were pioneering and the world remains in your debt will always be for the work that you did in New York during the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. In the context of everything you were seeing on a day-to-day -day yes. basis there as a doctor. Mm -hmm. Where was music in the midst of all of that trauma? During the years we're talking about, the ASAP and I was really busy, I have no doubt that music constituted an important part of keeping me going, I would say so. But I didn't feel that at the time. 
maybe because I didn't give it much thought. You know, if I had, maybe I might have recognized it. I just simply looked forward to the Sundays or time I had off. And sometimes I brought manuscript paper with me to the clinic. But I just did it. You know, I wasn't aware of it being a sustaining influence. It's the difference between something that has an effect and an awareness that that effect is you know, happening. And probably all the more important for precisely being that unconscious, if you like, activity, that whatever else it was, was something else. You know, manuscript paper and your clinical work, two mm-hmm. different worlds. Although, of course, there were moments where all that came together. You were, you know, making music with your, with your patients. Oh, yes, I did. And many of my patients, or many, some were performers. For a long time, I had a, a relationship with one of my patients who was a sort of modest pianist. It was better than me. We had a regular meeting to go through forehand music, similar with one of the earlier patients with AIDS, a proper 1983, 84 young man, a very talented composer, quite horribly tragic, who died at the age of 26, I think. He was you know, incredibly talented, but he was also good with instruments, reconditioning pianos and things. And uh, he was quite nimble on the flute, so I had, for a long time, we... We had this relationship with him. Then he got Kaposi sarcoma, if you recall the, those purple things that happened to people with AIDS. It affected his face, which is not a cancer in the sense that it doesn't metastasize or spread. And Bobby, his name was Bobby Blue, he got it on his face, and his face became very swollen, and to the point where he could no longer play the flute. His lips became puffy, and he couldn't do it. But he could play the piccolo. One can only surmise that the ability and the opportunities to make music when you're in a time of such distress, you know, is very significant. Well, I think even for those who listen to music, you know, mm. you know in times of extremity as, as it was, I don't think one can minimize the significance of the effect of listening as well as making music. When you listen to your own music, Joseph, yeah. I think of Fluctuations, which is a, yeah. a beautiful, intense sort of violin piece that you're working on recording as well, and which we can all access on your YouTube channel. Does it speak to you of the, of the time that it was written? What does it represent to you? Uh, I have to say I'm pretty much detached from it. I do need other people to point out, and then I can see it, as it were. It's as if I'm actively keeping a distance from it. It's out there. I had not written anything for solo violin. I was frightened to do it because I'm not a violinist, but the idea of this solo piece for violin, I thought really needed to explore all the different things the violin can do. But a friend, Andrew Tuvey, as a composer, who kept insisting I should do it, and then eventually, kind of, I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. (laughs) And that was was this year, that was earlier this year. It was earlier this year, yes. So so it's recent, actually, it's recent. For whatever reasons, I sort of accepted that I have a predilection for certain harmonies, chromaticisms. I just, I think all of us, you know, we have tastes, so that's got to reflect something about ourselves, you know. So I think all of us have an individual sort of closeness or affinity to certain kinds of, of music, and I do for sort of, you know, kind of rather tortured you know, harmonies and not just like the Berg, but, you know, late three of them. That stuck with me almost all my life, you know. I just kind of feel comfortable with that. And what are you listening to at the moment? I wonder, is it still Berg and Scriabin that's yes, so, getting you through well, the mode? Yes, the Met had a, a performance of Roderick just yes, Sunday, which I listened to. <laughs> it was uh, the William Kentridge production of oh, yes. Roderick. Berg is mercifully short. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's just wonderful music. And, uh, and there's also some, another aspect to music of this sort, is that uh, structurally it, it seems to be held together, if you like, mm. uh, by a reliance on sequence, which can then be transformed in so many different ways. I do think, you know, using a sequence in orders, permutations and things, does produce a unity, some kind of cohesion. I, I actually do that, I do that. It's in fluctuation, I call it fluctuation, because it begins with the 12 note sequence, and everything else then is kind of variations on that. But the variations of a repeated code, that's a, yes, a, a yeah. good description of so many pieces of music, and also for the uh, coherent chaos of our own bodies, from ourselves right. to its larger yeah, structures, yeah, too. Yeah. Okay, maybe, well, maybe. I'm but you know, to musical works are, are in a way like, like human bodies, actually, in a way. Mm-hmm. Perhaps. Yeah, well, uh, except that they tend to live longer than our bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> 
Joseph Sonnabend. Hear more of his long-lasting music on his YouTube channel.
friend and long-time collaborator, Andrew Tooby, probably about two years ago now, asked me if I'd help one of his students finish a solo violin piece. I had, of course, absolutely no idea that that would be the result and still less of an idea that I would meet, sadly, only ever via screens, um, this truly extraordinary man who, from what I've learnt since and from talking to those who did know him, um, for me, his music perfectly mirrors his, his person the intellectual rigour, the not unafraid to be difficult, the extraordinary and very human passion that I believe shines through his music. So it's been a great honour to help Joseph with this and to perform it for you tonight. I'd just like to briefly say before um, performing Morgan, uh, which Morgan has arranged by uh, uh, of Joseph's, 
um, but I had the immense privilege of uh, working with him on a few of his organ works um, just before the pandemic struck, actually. At the time, I was also working with Morgan on one of his uh, commissions that I was very fortunate to premiere at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, Joe came along uh, one evening with a whole bunch of scores to me to play, uh, for me to play of uh, immensely complex, emotional, beautiful music, uh, much like the music that you're hearing this evening, and also the piece that I'm about to play and will also play later, his epilogue as well. Um, and again, I think others will speak much better than me about him the man, but I think uh, his music certainly personifies many of the characteristics that uh, a lot of people have told me about him, immensely emotional, caring, beautiful, thoughtful, and, and very deep, and so have been going.
scientist and a doctor, but nothing about him as a musician. And we've been listening to his music, so I just thought a few words. Music was vital to him. He was self-taught as a composer, after work in New York as an escape from the horrendous pressure he must have been under. He went home and composed. He had no intention or desire for this music to be heard. He finished a piece, put it in a drawer and forgot about it. He came back to London and fell in with some musicians and decided that actually he would like his music performed. So one of the musicians that he fell in with was Andrew Tooby, whose somewhat thankless task was to get some of this music in performable um, condition, apart from working on new music with him. And at some point, he, Andrew got others of us involved, and that would involve going around to Joe's and Joe would say, well, what do you think about this one? And he'd get up a piece on Sibelius that he became very good with. Because he never envisaged the music being performed, he got less and less concerned about it being performable. So, for example, there were passages for piano music where you'd have things like this, nine notes in each chord. Now, the average pianist has five fingers. <laughs> so, you'd say, well, Joe, you can't do that. You'd say, oh, you see, of course you can't. It's, it's, an, it's impossible. It's unplayable. And you say, well, what do we do? Well, just cut out four notes or something. <laughs> Well, that still means you can't... You know, it. Well, what about... Just play the top note. <laughs> so, 94 notes would get reduced to about three, and it would sound fine. We didn't have time to go through all his compositions, there's hundreds of them, and whenever he would talk about it, he would say, well, I just guess that the pianist would just, you know, make their own version of it. You know, just leave out bits and, put, you know, change it around. So the interesting thought is that no two performances of a work of Joe's are going to be the same, because everyone's going to leave out different bits or rearrange it or edit it or whatever. So it's an interesting thought. There's loads of music out there, much of it uncatalogued, much of it still not um, performable, but hopefully one of these days, with enough Andrew Toobies and Morgans and people like that, some of it might get out there. So this is a little piece. Um, the other thing is we have no idea when pieces were written because he didn't put dates or anything like that. It's completely haphazard. He didn't put titles. So we have piece number 10. Oh, but he's already got piece number 10. So this piece number 10 is a slow one, and that's a fast one. This one's called April, and it's completely arbitrary.